Okay, so thank you very much for um, your attention throughout the day, and thank you. I'd like to welcome you now to uh, the final panel, uh, which is about the future of space exploration. I'm delighted that this is a topic which is being covered here today. Uh, and it's almost, uh, it's nice to think that on this very day, back in 1969, Neil, Buzz, and Michael were on the way to the moon. So it's now been 47 years since the first moon mission. Uh, only 12 men walked on the surface of the moon. The youngest is now 80, and we haven't been back to the moon in more than 43 years. But we haven't lost that space exploration. We might not have the space future we imagined back in 1969, but we are living in a world which is being transformed by space. And we're entering into a very new and exciting era in space exploration, particularly if you look at companies such as SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, a lot of commercial space companies, but also with the new robotic missions which are happening to explore our solar system, and Caroline will be talking about that uh, shortly. So you could almost say that the moon landings were the Columbus moment for space exploration, and we're now having the Mayflower moment in terms of space. So it's a very exciting era. And it's a, a genre which actually crosses across a lot of disciplines. So we're really excited to be here and to be discussing this with you today. So I'm going to welcome our first speaker, Carolyn Crawford, who's going to be talking about current space exploration. Thank you. We may not have put humans on any other planet, but what I want you to realise is that we are now developing hugely what we can do just with robotic exploration on its own. And there's a definite process of how you explore a planet using a robot. And it'll go through various stages. And where we've, what we've achieved at different parts in the solar system differs according to the proximity of the object we're studying, the planet we're studying, and also the potential for future science dividends from revisiting it. Now, your first way of looking at a planet is that initial reconnaissance that comes from a fly past. And already by the sort of mid-1980s, we had achieved a fly past of all eight planets, lastly with the sort of Voyager probes going uh, out through uh, the solar system and beyond as they're going now. We have then gone back and revisited many of those planets and looked at them in more detail. But there are smaller and more remote parts of the solar system where we are just beginning the fly past. Sometimes it's fortuitous, such as when you fly through the asteroid belt on the way to a more remote target, like this is asteroid Letitia. It's only 100 kilometers across, but viewed from the Rosetta spacecraft <coughs> as it flew past on its way to rendezvous with Comet 67P. And then about this time last year, we had the first fly past of the remote, well, I hesitate to call it planet, but for, I suggest there are plenty of Americans in the audience for the sake, of, we'll call it this morning, honorary planet Pluto. <laughs> we, flew, we only flew past Pluto for the first time last year. It took nine and a half years for the New Horizons probe to, to reach Pluto, and then it flew past it at 14 kilometers per second, whizzing past in the order of sort of 20 to 30 minutes. But of course, now we've got great sophisticated cameras on your initial fly past. Unlike when we first flew past Mars and you're getting the first sort of 20 images of the surface where you see there are volcanoes and craters and canyons, now we can see the surface geology in great detail. We have very sophisticated cameras. We also probe in the atmosphere, the radiation environment around uh, Pluto, and indeed, looking at some of the fantastic geology that we had not expected to see on the surface of Pluto where you have vast ice plains of nitrogen ice, uh, like enormous glaciers, surrounded by both rock and rock made of water ice, huge mountains three kilometers high made of water ice. And the fact there are so few craters on the surface of Pluto reveals that it has an active geology where the surface is rapidly recoated. So this is our first view of Pluto as a fly past. <coughs> Beyond a fly past, your next reconnaissance will be from an orbital mission. Now, obviously, we've orbited many of the nearby planets, so Mars, Venus, more recently Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. We're now at the stage of investigating some of the large objects within the asteroid belt with the Dawn mission, which is an iron drive spacecraft that is visiting the two largest objects in the asteroid belt, Vesta here, which is about 500 kilometers across, which is a very, it's an inner asteroid, so it's more like the rocky planets, it's made of rock and metal, 
and also Ceres, the dwarf planet sitting in the asteroid belt, which has a very different chemistry of the surface. You can see it's got mineral deposits that require a water-rich environment. So these are two extremes that bridge the gap between the rocky <coughs> planets and the gas giants. So what do these two dwarf planets, or if you like, protoplanets, tell us about perhaps the history or formation of different kinds of planets in our solar system? And you will do an orbital mission where you will start a long way from the planet and then drop to lower altitudes. And the Dawn mission is currently orbiting Ceres, uh, closer to the surface than the International Space Station is to Earth, and providing these fantastic close-up views of, and also, you know, analysing the chemical deposits on the surface. There is, of course, a new mission that's just gone into orbit around Jupiter. The Juno mission arrived there on the 4th of July. And this is an orbiter, which is, if this is Jupiter, it's going to take a very long orbit, lasting about, you know, uh, 14 days, where it views Jupiter from far away, and then comes in and skirts really close, only about 4,000 kilometers from the top of the cloud tops in Jupiter and out again. And is going to be studying you know, the origin of Jupiter's magnetic fields, where the heat comes from inside Jupiter, how this helps generate some of these complex weather patterns you see in the surface. And not just that, this is, of course, a solar-powered spacecraft. So it's got these sort of enormous arrays of solar panels because Jupiter's five times further out from the sun than the Earth is, so your power from the sunlight goes down to about 25th of what's available at, um, at the Earth. So this is also the furthest solar-powered spacecraft. You can orbit around a planet, and then you start doing a bit more of a controlled orbit. Now, we've already done this around Jupiter, where we've gone and investigated the moons in great detail with the Galileo spacecraft just after the turn of the century. Future missions, both NASA and European Space Agency missions, will go and investigate some of these larger Jupiter moons in great detail, particularly those that have evidence for significant bodies of liquid water under the surface. Again, looking at their potential for you know, hosting life, looking at the chemistry, looking at the availability of this water. So this kind of steering round a planet and its moons and going back and revisiting and investigating detail, of course, has been shown to great you know, beauty with the Cassini mission at Saturn, where you're not just observing the rings and the gas giant, but since the mission arrived there in 2004, it's been doing lots of complicated fly paths, not just through the rings on initial, um, when it arrived at the system, but also repeated fly paths of various of the large moons, seeing how they change with the seasons as the system comes close to or tilts differently towards the sun. And not just that, you can revisit features of interest. You can also do fly paths through features. So this is one of those ice moons. This is Enceladus around Saturn. The Cassini satellite is able to swoop through those huge plumes of water vapor that are outgassing from cracks in the ice. It sweeps through them. It can, if you like, sniff. It can work out what chemicals are released within this water vapor, telling us something about the chemistry of these oceans beneath the surface. And once you've done a good surveying from orbit, and mapping of these bodies from orbit, your next stage is to put a robotic lander on the surface. And the furthest we've actually landed is the, la the largest moon of Saturn, called Titan. It's bigger than the planet Mercury. It's only a moon because it's an orbit around Saturn rather than, in principle, orbit around the sun. This is a fantastic planet. You can see it's got a smoggy atmosphere. We think this is like Earth, but it's a very early version of Earth that's been kept in the deep freeze of space, so it's never developed all those chemical reactions that have led to today's life, today's, life, today's uh, version of Earth. You've got a nitrogen-rich atmosphere with a methane haze. And one of the first things Cassini did was drop the probe Huygens, which took two hours to parachute down to the surface, observing all the time the rivers, the tributaries, the estuaries, the damp lake beds that are made of methane, liquid methane on Titan. And this eventually, after two hours, just settled down at the surface and observed the surface just very briefly. And here you see a range of pebbles, an erosion showing there's liquid methane flown across the surface, and that was just the shadow of the parachute crossing over <laughs> there. <coughs> so we, you can 
I mean, this is a planet where, well, a moon, where you have an active weather cycle that we see change with the seasons with lakes and seas, snowfall, rainfall, all made of methane because it's, you know, minus 190 degrees C because it's that much further out from the sun. So that's the furthest we've landed a probe. We have, of course, most recently landed a small spacecraft on this comet, 67P. I think this is one of the great selfies of all time yeah. from space, <laughs> looking along the solar panel out to observing the comet in the distance. So Rosetta spacecraft caught up with the comet, chasing it round the solar system, seeing how, and seeing how it changes as it approaches the sun with the outgassing material. Again, you observe from a distance, and then you swoop low, and you observe distinct and detailed features on the surface and how they change, how cracks might open up. And as you were, after arriving at the comet, it also deposited a lander on the surface. You know, talk about trying to hit a moving target, the little fillet lander. And this is a lander that doesn't just sit and observe. This does active experimentation. It carried out a suite of experiments where you actually require contact with the comet to enable to carry them out. And this was a fairly short-lived experiment. When you're closer to home, if you want to investigate Mars, and I will say Mars is one of our main targets of robotic exploration, you can have much longer-lived experiments. We have beautiful views of the surface of Mars now, both from stationary landers and mobile landers, such as Curiosity. Here we are, another selfie. And it's landed in a crater. You can see the distinct crater walls, the crater peak. Just down here, it's just bored a hole into the rock. And this spacecraft has, well, this robot has roamed over the surface of the planet for a couple of years now. You probably can't see, but there are the tracks observed from space here. But look, it's busy. This is active exploration. It's scooping up samples. It's drilling into rocks. It's got a laser. It's got a microscope. It's got lab experiments. It can pick up scoop. It can bake samples of soil in its belly and work out the, the chemistry involved. It can go across and it can investigate things. There's an awful lot of active exploration we can do with really mobile rovers like this. Now, of course, we're not just going to stop the curiosity. There's a European Space Agency mission, which is already on its way where it's going to have both an orbiter checking the uh, radiation and the uh, trace gases within the atmosphere of Mars, a lander that's going to study uh, the environment from the ground, and then in two years' time, there'll be yet another rover arriving at Mars. Now, what we know about Mars is that we're searching for, you know, its potential for either present or past life on the surface. And at the minute, we haven't, you know, stopped you know, stop press, we haven't found anything in terms of life. We found lots of places that aren't life on Mars, but one of the interesting places could be down under the surface, away from the radiation from the sun. And indeed, one of the things that ExoMars is going to do is it's going to drill down two meters below the surface, extract core samples, and we can begin to examine those. And obviously, there's much geology, there's much we can learn about the history of the solar system from all of this mission. And there's also the potential for life developing in other planets, other environments. And you're wise to work out the sterility or otherwise of a planet before you send humans there. First of all, do we want to contaminate these planets? Are we already contaminating these planets with our germs? Do you want to bring germs back to you know, uh, the, the Earth? Things like that. We need to really have an idea about the life in these planets. Because the next stage, of course, is bringing samples back. And the only place we brought considerable samples back is through the Apollo missions, where several <laughs> kilograms of moon rock have been brought back. And most responsible missions will aim to bring a heavy sample back before you send a human out and expect to bring them back. Okay? We would like to know there's that proof of concept. And at the minute, <laughs> we're just doing much more snatch and grab. So, for example, collecting particles from the tail of a comet. We had the Stardust mission in 2004, which swooped through the tail of Comet Wild, exposed an aerogel tray in which particles sank in and embedded within the aerogel, which then closed up and brought those samples back to Earth. We've had the Japanese Hayabusa mission, visiting this very sort of porous, icy asteroid, Itakawa, where it um, obviously 
artist impression. We didn't send a camera to snap the moment, but <laughs> where, you know, the spacecraft will fire a pellet that scoops up bits of regolith from the asteroid surface. It swoops down, collects them, and brings those back as a sample mission. Now, this didn't go 100% to plan. He only had about 100 particles, each about 100 microns across. But somewhere, we, in a lab on Earth, we have particles of asteroids. And there are future missions which are going back to asteroids because, of course, they're just a bit beyond Mars. They're quite easy to get to. We have missions, both um, NASA and there's a second Hayabusa Japanese mission going back and doing sample return. So we're doing um, either landing on the surface, kicking up dust, or with a large boom, kind of scraping a bit as you fly past an asteroid. Or even further into the future, the next kind of stage of robotic return would be to go and collect. This is the asteroid redirect mission, which is an idea of NASA's, where you send your asteroid to go and collect a boulder, probably about several ton boulder, pick it up, bring it back, and put it into a stable orbit around the moon. How about that? So you might, this could be happening by the mid 2020s. And then perhaps not only do you have a proof of being able to redirect asteroids or Part of things around the solar system, but also you provide a nice little staging post for astronauts potentially to go and explore in the future as we advance <laughs> the human exploration. And I think this is where I pass over to Martin for the next stage. Right. Well, I'm going to start with a flashback to uh, probably the best student they had in the college next door, uh, <laughs> Isaac Newton, 300 years ago. I show him because he must have thought about spaceflight. This is a famous picture from uh, uh, one of his books, and uh, he imagines a cannonball being fired from a mountain top, and if it's fired fast enough, then its path curves downwards no faster than the Earth curves way underneath it. It goes into orbit, and he must have calculated that you have to fire your cannonball at 18,000 miles an hour for that to happen. And that was not feasible in his time, and indeed this didn't happen until uh, the Sputnik, which went up in 1957, followed four years later uh, by... Uh, sorry, no, um, by, by um, Gagarin, and then uh, we had the Apollo astronauts sending back this iconic picture. And I treasure this uh, uh, picture signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts who walked on the moon. But of course, we've got to remember that to most people in this audience, this is ancient history. Uh, as we heard, uh, the last man on the moon came back 43 years ago. Uh, so uh, this is ancient history. And the reason it's ancient history, of course, is that the Apollo program was uh, uh, financed for reasons of superpower rivalry to beat the Russians. Once that had uh, been achieved by the Americans, uh, then there was no uh, particular motive to continue. Had the expenditure continued at the same level, there would have been footprints on Mars by now. But what has happened instead is that uh, humans have gone in low orbit around the Earth, uh, mainly in the International Space Station, shown here. Far less inspiring than the heroic, pioneering Russian and US space exploits of the 1960s. The space station is probably the most expensive artifact ever constructed. And frankly, its scientific and technical payoff is not as cost effective as unmanned missions. And of course, we've seen from Carolyn all the wonderful things that have been done by unmanned missions going right out to the edge of the solar system. Uh, nor, I think, is it very inspirational for people to go into low Earth orbit these days. In fact, the space station only really makes news uh, when uh, they find the loo doesn't work um, <laughs> or when astronauts perform stunts such as uh, the Canadian Chris Hatfield's uh, guitar playing and singing. <laughs> and there is, of course, transient national pride in a country where uh, a compatriot goes into orbit. For instance, it was a big deal in Mongolia when their first astronaut went up 33 years ago. But 
I'm far more excited by the recent deep space triumphs that Carolyn has described um, and uh, the amazing pictures uh, we've had from Pluto and Rosetta are especially amazing when we realize that the technology they used is 15 years out of date because they've been 10 years on their journey, five years in the planning, and so if you think how mobile phones have changed in 15 years, you can realize how much better uh, they could do now uh, with these robotic probes if they were starting from scratch today. So that indicates how the developers are going to be very excited. And indeed, uh, these probes that we've heard about are, I think, forerunners of flotillas of tiny but hugely more sophisticated craft that will, in the coming decades, explore the entire solar system, planets, moons, and asteroids. And indeed, I expect we'll have robotic fabricators that can construct huge lightweight structures in space, maybe using material mined from the moon or from asteroids. But what is going to be the role for humans? Robotics is advancing fast, whereas the cost gap between manned and unmanned missions remains very high. So, as a scientist or practical man, I see a diminishing case for sending people into space at all. But as a human being rather than just a scientist, I hope some people now living will walk on Mars as an adventure and as a step towards the stars. But I think they will be privately funded. Their flights will then be far cheaper than NASA's or ESA's for two reasons. First, they can uh, have the sort of Silicon Valley can-do spirit, which Lockheed Martin and companies have rather lost, um, and also they could be more riskier. Think back to the Space Shuttle. That failed twice in nearly 140 launches. Each of those failures was a big national trauma in America. It delayed the probe for three years, cost billions of dollars extra. But test pilots and adventurers are prepared to accept much more than a 2% risk. And companies like Elon Musk's uh, will soon be offering orbital flights, although they will be slightly more risky. Looking further ahead, there are plans for week-long trips round the far side of the moon, going further from Earth than any humans have ever been, but avoiding the challenge of a moon landing and takeoff. I'm told a ticket's been booked for the second flight, but not for the first flight. <laughs> I don't know what we learned from that. And uh, Dennis Tito, an entrepreneur and former astronaut, may not be crazy in planning to send people on a trip round Mars and back. This would involve about 500 days in isolated confinement. And the ideal crew for that would be a stable, middle-aged couple. <laughs> happy to be cooped up for a long time uh, and not too worried about the radiation risk. <laughs> and there's another scheme that would allow you to land on Mars but to stay there. No return ticket. And in fact, Elon Musk himself has said that he hopes to die on Mars but not on impact. <laughs> uh, and he's now 44 years old, so that's not a crazy uh, expectation for him, if he so chooses. The point, of course, is that space is a hostile environment for humans, as movies like Gravity and The Martian remind us. <clears throat> and I think that's why the phrase space tourism should be avoided, because it lulls people into thinking that such ventures are routine and low risk. And if that's the perception, the inevitable accidents, as tragically happened already with Virgin Galactic suborbital test flight, they'll be as traumatic as those of the Space Shuttle were. Instead, these cut-price ventures must be sold as dangerous sports for intrepid explorers. But despite the risks, a century from now, groups of pioneers may have established independent bases from the Earth, on Mars or maybe on asteroids. Those who do this will be adventurers in the mold of, say, uh, Felix Baumgartner, he was the guy who free fell at supersonic speed from a high altitude balloon. Or the British explorer Ranulph Fiennes, who among other challenges has dragged a sledge across the Antarctic in the winter. We admire such people for pushing the boundaries of what humans can do, even if we don't want to emulate them. 
So likewise, I think we would cheer on these deep space pioneers. But it's important that I think we should never expect mass emigration from the Earth. In fact, it's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. Nowhere in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. And another thing. By 2100, there'll be huge advances in genetics and in cyborg technology. Whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish these space pioneers good luck in redesigning their progeny to adapt to hostile environments. They'll become a new species. Indeed, they may transition to fully electronic intelligence, roaming the solar system, constructing massive artifacts. The timescale for the emergence of such post-humans will not be the slow Darwinian time scale, it could be just a few centuries. And that's a mere instant compared to the time scale that led to humanity's emergence. And more relevantly, it's less than a millionth of the vast expanses of time before the sun dies. And even when the sun dies, the universe may go on expanding. Indeed, to quote Murray Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> So, even if intelligence were now unique to the Earth, it needn't remain a cosmic sideshow. Embodied in generations of self-improving machines, it could, during these future aeons, spread far beyond the solar system. Millennia-long interstellar voyages would hold no terrors for these near-immortal post-human beings. So, if Earth were the unique cradle of life, it could, nonetheless, in this far future, have truly cosmic significance. But are we alone? Or is there already a galactic club out there waiting for us to join? This is the question astronomers are most often asked. And we're getting a bit closer now to answering it. In the last 20 years, there's been a real new Copernican revolution. We've learned that the stars we see in the sky aren't mere twinkling points of light. There are other suns, nearly all orbited by retinues of planets. And indeed, it's estimated that there are a billion planets in our Milky Way galaxy, rather like the young Earth. So will these planets have life on them? We can't at the moment set the odds at all. That's because the origin of life, the transition from biochemistry to the first replicating and metabolizing creatures is still a mystery. We don't know how it happened on the Earth. It could have been a rare, even unique fluke that only happened here, or it could be something that would happen in any environment resembling the young Earth. Next generation telescopes will be powerful enough to, to image the, uh, uh, the nearest of these planets. This is a picture of the uh, uh, planned European telescope. They're not very imaginative in their nomenclature. It's called the Extremely Large Telescope. And uh, they've leveled the mountaintop in Chile where this will go, and it will have a made, made mirror 39 meters across. That's probably about twice the width of this room. Uh, not one big sheet of glass, of course, but a mosaic of 800 pieces of glass. And that telescope will be powerful enough to tell us whether the nearest of these planets have a biosphere, whether they have continents and oceans, and maybe even whether there's something green growing on them. Well, even if simple life is common, intelligent life could still be very rare. And it would plainly, however, be even more momentous and exciting to discover any signal from space that was manifestly artificial. Radio beeps or flashes of light from some celestial laser scanning the Earth or something like that. And as you know, there have been uh, uh, efforts to look for such signals. In fact, as Astronomer Royal, I get uh, um, letters from people who say that they've uh, met the aliens, that they know there are aliens there, they've come here. Um, and uh, uh, I 
respond to these people in two ways. I say, um, do you really think that if the aliens had made the effort to come here, they would just uh, make a corn circle, meet one or two well-known cranks and go away again? <laughs> I don't think they would. And I also tell these people to write to each other and not to me. <laughs> well, but despite that, despite the evidence now being inconclusive, um, it's not crazy to suspect that there might be intelligent life out there, although even the optimists uh, would bet only a few percent on the chance. But it's worth a look. And in fact, a deeper search is being developed. A Russian investor called Yuri Milner has committed uh, hundred million dollars over the next 10 years to enable a deeper search using time on the biggest radio telescopes. And uh, I've agreed to chair his advisory group for this. And although it is a gamble, it's surely worth the gamble because success would be so fantastic and we should be grateful that Mr. Milner spends his money in this way rather than on a yacht or a football team. <laughs> well, another thought one has is that life on a distant planet could evolve either slower or faster than it did here. If it evolved slower, we detect nothing in the way of intelligent signals. But if it evolved faster, or was on an older planet that had a billion year head start over the Earth, then it could likely already have reached the post-human stage. And I've argued just now that maybe only a few centuries before flesh and blood humans are transcended by inorganic intelligence. And that machines may then persist, continuing to evolve for billions of years. That suggests that if we were to detect ET, we would most likely, be most unlikely to catch it in the brief sliver of time when it was still in organic form. Indeed, referring to E.T. as an alien civilization may be too restrictive, because a civilization connotes a society of individuals. In contrast, E.T. might be a single integrated intelligence wandering in interstellar space. Well, I'm running out of time, which is perhaps a good thing, um, but let me focus back closer to the here and now in closing. Because even in the context of a concertina timeline, extending billions of years into the future, as well as billions of years into the past of a dominion evolution, this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has our planet's future in its hands. Our creative intelligence could trigger the transition from an Earth-based to a space-faring species and from biological to artificial intelligence transitions that could inaugurate billions of years of post-human evolution, even more marvelous than what's happened and led to us. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, cyber, or environmental catastrophes that foreclose all such potentialities. So our Earth, this pale blue dot in the cosmos, is a special place. It may be a unique place. And we're its stewards at a especially crucial era. And that's, I think, an important message for all of us, whether or not we're astronomers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for that, Martin. That was absolutely incredible and, and fascinating. And I, I do feel like all of us are privileged to be living in an era where we're on this cusp of this new dawn of exploration, you know, beyond our Earth, beyond the cradle of Earth, and, and further into the solar system. So it is an incredibly exciting time. And I think um, I'm going, certainly going to pick up on points from both your, your fascinating talks. I feel like we need a whole day uh, just for this, um, to scratch the surface of this one subject. But my, my first question is, and I, I would always argue, and always have argued, that as a species, the exploration of space is the most significant thing we will ever do. But when we live in a world where there is so much trouble and difficulties, uh, why would you argue what we're doing now in terms of space exploration is so significant and so important? Well, I'd say two things. One is that there's a scientific quest, and uh, if um, our countries want to spend a certain amount on science, you can decide uh, what part of the frontiers you should devote a certain amount of money to, and I think everyone would agree that uh, one of the key questions uh, is 
the question of uh, our place in the universe, how life began, etc. So I think everyone will accept that some part of uh, the science budget should be spent on this. But I would uh, say that if we think of the, uh, the human adventure side, then it is better if that is funded by the private sector. There are lots of wealthy people uh, who could frankly bankroll a multi-billion dollar project. And I think that is probably the way it will happen um, because these people um, w are motivated and, as I said, they can accept higher risks than uh, NASA or ESA could. And so that's why I think it should be the private sector that does the manned space flight, uh, whereas the, uh, the public sector, uh, which of course does some of the uh, public service things like meteorology satellites and GPS and things of that kind, um, and, uh, uh, and, or, and also um, for communications. Okay, well, Caroline, do you want to come in? Well, I mean, I obviously would agree with Martin that, I mean, from the science point of view, I think it's a cultural thing as well. It's that investigation of really the origin of the Earth, origin of, of, of us and life, and our place of our solar system within the whole cosmos. So I would hope to think that those kind of questions are culturally important. Answering them is important. The other thing that is a byproduct of everything we do, and I think particularly given the news over recent weeks, is the fact that space is an, is an area where there is huge international collaboration between governments, between scientists, between you know, technology experts. And I think there's a great deal of good that can come out of uh, people from different nations working together towards a common aim. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Yes, could I just add that uh, uh, science is a truly global culture, of course. It does span all political uh, and uh, religious divides. Um, and so that's why it's important to pursue. And of course, um, there is wide fascination. I mean, uh, kids are fascinated by dinosaurs, for instance. What could be more irrelevant to everyday life than <laughs> <laughs> but, um, And uh, uh, building on that, they're fascinated about not just evolution in the past, but about what will happen in the future and what might be out there. So I, I think um, there is public support for this. Indeed, if you were to uh, um, do an opinion poll of people coming out of a science fiction movie, I'm sure many would be very happy if it were possible to hypothecate some of the tax revenues in that movie for things like this, because that's not the way it's done. But I think that indicates that uh, uh, despite all the other pressures, um, there would be broad uh, satisfaction that some people, whether it's uh, billionaires or some governments, is spending some money on activities which certainly, when the history of this century is written, will be among the high points. And would you say it's fair to say as well that um, what we're doing now in terms of commercial space exploration is no different to what we've done throughout history. We're just in a different, yep. a different format. So we explored the Earth and then private companies went in and now we're seeing the same thing with space. So we've had the, the Columbus moment, as I said earlier, and now we're having the Mayflower moment with the commercial companies. Is that something you'd agree with? Well, yes, I mean, you need to think about what you want the space agencies to spend their money on and not necessarily just reinventing or refining something they've already worked out how to do. I mean, that is where the private companies can come a lot better. You probably want the space agencies to be spending their budget and working on how to get to different objects or how to do different science on different planets. Okay, so going back to your incredible talk, um, Martin, uh, one point which really stands out is the search for aliens, the search for life elsewhere in the universe. And, you know, it's not within, the, well, we're not beyond the realms of possibility that within the next 50 years or so we could have the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. How close do you think we are to getting there? And, and would you agree with Seth, what Seth Jostak said at SETI, that actually alien life is more likely to be robotic than like us? Yes, um, uh, I mean, as I, I implied, it's far more likely. And the reason for that is that if the evolution was to track anything like on the Earth, uh, then it would be just a few centuries of uh, uh, technological civilization um, uh, spearheaded by organic beings like us and then the machines may take over, and they have billions of years ahead. So uh, it's far more likely that anything we detect will be something which is uh, um, uh, beyond uh, anything we can imagine. And incidentally, I think that means that if we detect something, we might be able to show it is artificial, say very narrow band signals, something pulsing in odd ways, a set of prime numbers or something like that. But I think the idea that it would be a message that we could decode uh, is rather less likely. Um, and uh, um, because the culture gap would be very wide. I mean, in principle, <laughs> as, <laughs> in principle, of course, uh, uh, any aliens uh, with technology, they would share a knowledge of maths and physics. 
um, uh, atoms are the same out there as they are here. They'd be gazing out if they have eyes on the same cosmos. Um, so uh, there would be a common culture, um, but I think it's unlikely that we would have a message. But of course, the other thing we know about uh, this is that um, even the nearest of, of these um, uh, possible aliens is going to be tens of light years away. Um, and so um, there's plenty of time for us to devise a measured response and no scope for any snappy repartee at all. <laughs> So when Carl Sagan convinced NASA to put the, the plaque on the Pioneer mission, it's yeah. very unlikely aliens are going to see that and decipher it. Well, that, that's, well I think that was a, an interesting exercise, and, uh, and in fact, uh, the um, Milner's project is doing a similar exercise for schools <laughs> to devise things, but of course, um, it's not clear. Uh, it's most unlikely that that will be detected by anyone. Um, the best way in which we could attract attention um, is obviously through... Um, uh, radio or, or, or radar, um, and there are some people who worry that we should try and hide from what might be out there, but I, I can't take that seriously because um, they would know we're here anyway. Uh, I would say. <laughs> that was going to be my next uh, question. Uh, and they may have been watching for a million years uh, on this planet where interesting things might be happening. But could you not argue that throughout history when um, civilizations have met, they've often fought and tried to destroy one another, could that not be the same with aliens? Because I know the UN the yes. Department of Outer Space Affairs, they don't want to target stars with signals. Yeah, yes, yes. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I think that's a... Uh, I can't take that very, very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's not wrong. I think the UN's got other things to worry about. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, Caroline, you talked about some of the incredible uh, robotic missions that we've had within our own solar system. Um, we could have been, well, Buzz Aldrin, second man on the moon, argues that we could have been on Mars by the 80s or the 90s if, uh, as Martin had said, we'd carried on with the same progression with Apollo. When do you think we'll get to the point when we catch up in terms of human exploration of our solar system, and why is it so significant to get human boots on Mars? Well, I'm not... <laughs> it's significant to get human boots on Mars for a point of view from exploration. And again, it's harking back to the cultural idea of exploration. Exploration isn't the same science. It does enable science. That comes along later. But you see, I'm not in a rush to put human boots on Mars. That's, other people are driving that. I'm, I'm still excited about what we can do remotely and robotically. But that's because I'm interested in science. And I think putting humans is a very different matter. And you've got, a, as Martin has stressed, you've got a very different drive <laughs> behind that. As to when it's going to happen, first, I reckon we're going to have to go back to the moon. Because there's a lot of proving technology, you know, improving technology um, that we need to test out in space. And it makes much more sense to do all this proof of concept and demonstrate it all works when you're only about three days travel away from the Earth and about a three second time delay in terms of your radio signals than starting out with the, the going to Mars. So to me, the sensible way to proceed would be to return to the moon or um, maybe, if you like, a moon around Mars do that before you actually set foot on Mars. Maybe you don't even need to send humans to Mars. Maybe we can observe Mars from one of the moons. Though I must admit, it would be a shame to go all that way and then not actually get down onto the surface. <laughs> <laughs> and how can you see robotic missions progressing, uh, particularly you're looking at moons uh, Europa and Enceladus, with a moon around Jupiter and a moon around Saturn, where there might potentially be life? How far are we away, realistically, from having a, a robotic mission which would land on one of those candidate moons? Well. Again, it depends on what comes back from the next, this Europa mission and the JUICE mission, which tar both targeting Europa, the ice moon around Jupiter, and they're going to be like early to mid 2020s at the current estimates. Depending on what they find, I mean, they're going to be measuring the thickness of the icy crust, you know, the depth of the liquid ocean underneath. If they find it's possible, the next mission, perhaps a, few, a couple of decades then, would be to send. Uh, a probe that can land on the surface, melt its way through the ice. If you know where the thin, thinnest point in the ice is, you could even send a little robotic submarine down to explore the ocean underneath. You know, there are all kinds of things that you can yet do that don't require a human presence, and yet can advance, you know, huge understanding about the potentiality for life elsewhere in our solar system. Yes. Uh, and of course, we should realize that robotics and generalized machine learning are advancing very fast. I mean, it's certainly the case that uh, uh, a real geologist with a hammer. Uh, could perhaps discover things on Mars which the Curiosity probe won't be able to notice or detect. But uh, 30 years from now, uh, the kind of 
robots we can uh, send might have the same capabilities as any human geologist. And so that, again, weakens the practical case for sending people. And, oh, sorry. Well, I was going to uh, disagree with that. And, you know, in terms of we can wait another couple of decades to get the question if it's much safer to send a robot than a human. And the other thing you have to realise is that any human exploration in the solar system will depend entirely on robotic development as well. If we, set, if we ever build a, a, a lunar base, you can bet that most of the work is going to be done remotely by robots, first landing um, stuff or you know, remote control bulldozers, if you like, actually clearing the space. There's going to be a lot of preparation, whether it's on the moon or on Mars. And any astronauts working on those planets will be working alongside and assisted by robots. So there are ways that the robotic exploration is not completely divorced from the human exploration. One will assist the other. Okay, and, and Martin, you said maybe in 100 years' time we'll all be robots ourselves as well. Well, <laughs> or cyborgs. We, well, we won't, but uh, uh, I think it's clear that robots will uh, gradually acquire a larger number of human capabilities. I mean, obviously, they're better than us at many things already, um, but uh, the question is how fast they will acquire more human capabilities. Okay, and um, I think we've got about 25 minutes left, and I know you need to leave on time, so if we can, I hope you've all got lots and lots of questions, so if you can open it up to the audience and raise your hands and we'll come around with the microphone. And ladies and... Oh. Okay. <laughs> Hi, so I think I'm probably not the only person in the room for whom the terms like Columbus moment and Mayflower moment are very troubling um, and, <laughs> uh, you know, evoke a lot of questions about what are some of the broader risks beyond, you know, mission failures that this sort of either manned or unmanned exploration carries. Yes. Um, well, I think, as um, Carolyn briefly mentioned, um, uh, if, if there's some evidence of any kind of life, say, on Mars, uh, then obviously there's a danger of uh, infections, but there might be a feeling that we should preserve it, not contaminate it, rather like we feel about national parks or the Antarctic on Earth. And that's, of course, one reason why one is worried about free enterprise and the frontier spirit because if that's the way manned space flight develops, um, there won't be these concerns, as there would be if it was done by, by government. So, so I think there are, there are concerns of, of that kind. And if you want a good illustration of that, I recommend, I think it's Kim Stanley Robinson's latest book, Aurora, which deals with exactly this dish issue of uh, what might be awaiting for you on a possibly sterile planet. Um, but also just to come back, talking about dangers, yes, there are the dangers just at the bacterial level, that you also have to be realistic about the real physical dangers to humans in space. As soon as you get out of our atmosphere and out of our magnetosphere, you are very vulnerable to all kinds of things. It's not just the reduced gravity and the effect that has on your body in terms of your muscle control, how the fluid distributes itself around the body, uh, the, the bone damage, the brittle bones you get. It's also the radiation that you're unprotected from, from the sun. Not just as you travel to the moon, but when you're on the surface of the moon or, you know, that six-month voyage to Mars, that's an awfully long time to be exposed to potential radiation from the sun that we don't receive here on the Earth. And also when you're on the surface of Mars. So I would not like to be, you know, arriving at the surface of Mars after nine or six to nine months of microgravity and then be in a sort of weakened state in terms of both my muscles and the brittleness of my bones. There's huge potential damage to human <coughs> beings in space. But I would just want to add to that, actually. I would argue that um, certainly with the, the space shuttle program with Challenger and Columbia, um, we became risk adverse. We lost two shuttles. We lost 14 astronauts in those accidents, and the shuttle program became expensive, and it was ultimately the end of it. And, and I would argue that certainly there's enough people willing to go to Mars and aware of the risk, whether they will do it or not is, a, is another question. But um, throughout history, there has been risk in exploration, and also the moon was the first time we had a return trip. It's normally a one-way trip throughout history, so you could argue that if we, humans did go to Mars this century, it may be a one-way trip and it would be a riskier trip. So we've got to keep that risk in exploration. And, I mean, of course, they won't be going into the unknown to anything like the extent that earlier explorers were, um, because uh, you know, when Magellan went to the Southern Hemisphere, he had no idea what he was going to find. Um, you know, um, humans with their heads in that show <laughs> uh, uh, chest and things like that, where he didn't know. Uh, whereas now, uh, anyone who goes to Mars, they know roughly speaking what it's like, and indeed they're not out of communication. Uh, they can communicate with about um, half an hour's time delay, but it's nothing like the, uh, uh, the, the, the 
difficulty which the ancient explorers had of being completely out of touch, completely unclear about what they would find. Okay, next question. Oh, oh there's a gentleman there with the microphone. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you've spoken about the importance or at least concern with preserving sterile planets in their uh, sterile state and uh, making sure that we don't carry any sort of microbes up on things that we send there. But I was wondering, if we did discover we were alone in the universe, would what would your opinion be about trying to colonize other planets, but not with human life, but with uh, extremophile bacteria or something, so intentionally ca contaminating sterile planets, because perhaps we have a responsibility to spread life throughout the universe? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you why? <laughs> Serious, no, seriously, why would, you, why would you even contemplate doing that? So, <laughs> I'm not necessarily contemplating doing okay. it. I would rather hear your opinion. So if you feel really strongly against that, I'm really interested in that. I think some people would probably share the opinion that life is an extraordinary, and if it's really rare, then perhaps a thing worth preserving in an infinite universe, maybe we should spread it to one or two other planets if it's unique to ours. Yes, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I would question your use of the word "we" because that implies this is a global decision. I mean, I think the way uh, this kind of enterprise is going to evolve is going to be increasingly sort of anarchic, especially if private enterprise comes in, and um, uh, and I think it it it, it may happen. And uh, uh, if some people want to do this, then uh, the rest of us can't stop them, really. So I think it, it, may, ha it may happen. But perhaps um, uh, going back to the likelihood of life, um, I think uh, uh, within 20 years, there's one thing we will understand better, and that is uh, how life began on Earth. We don't yet know that. There are lots of serious people working on it now. And that will tell us two things. It will tell us uh, how likely it is. It will also tell us whether the DNA RNA basis of all life on Earth is somehow uniquely good, or whether any other life we find will have a quite different chemical basis. Okay, there's a gentleman in front with a structure. Yes, thank you. Um, I just have a question that, uh, so in the, in the 1960s, 70s, we have a, a very strong rival, rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union that has led to a uh, very advanced um, exploration of space. I'm wondering that to date, um, in terms of um, uh, international affairs, there's still some kind of the rivalries, uh, particularly perhaps to, in the respect of the rising China. So I'm wondering if, uh, do you see any sense of uh, uh, this kind of uh, rivalries may also lead to a competition in the space exploration and um, in the future, or whether would do you think that would be some kind of a, a secret e exploration that we do not know about? Mm. And uh, mm. or in the future, what do you see as whether there will be chances for collaboration between yes. the, the the people who are competing to collaborate? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I mean, the, 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 there is lots of collaboration already, um, and of course, uh, uh, China and indeed India have successful space programs, and other countries do. And of course, many, many countries are launching um, uh, satellites into Earth orbit for practical purposes, and this can be done very, very cheaply. Um, I think uh, um, other people know more about China than me, um, but of course, um, it could be that China may uh, want to do a space spectacular. Um, and China obviously has the resources that if they wanted to do, to do an Apollo-type program, uh, they, they could do it. And I suspect if they did decide to do this, they would aim for Mars, because if they want to assert superpower power, parity with the US, it would be very sensible to do what the US did 50 years earlier. They'd have to leapfrog what the Americans did and go to Mars. So uh, it, one possible scenario is that the Chinese uh, decide that they want to do a spectacular and go to Mars. And if they decided that, then they could surely do it within 20 years. And, and I would just add with China, what I find fascinating is, is during the Apollo era, China was under Mao and many people were unaware in China of the, the moon landings. And in 2013, they landed uh, the Jade Rabbit on the surface of the moon and they're now actually planning on sending a rover to the far side of the moon, which is something which hasn't been done before. And there's mm -hmm. certainly that, it is more secretive, the Chinese space program, but the culture is certainly ambitious. And I think we will see 
a rise in China. They are one of the rising stars. They're also working with developing countries in order to boost their space exploration. So it's an exciting time. But I think the real new space race will become between the commercial companies. We're already seeing that with um, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin and Elon Musk and SpaceX, so who are both landing rockets back on Earth and launching commercial systems. So I think there will be a new space race, but I don't think... You know, you can never say never, but in, in my opinion, I don't think we'll ever see another Apollo-type space race in the foreseeable future. Thanks. Uh, so you don't need me to tell you, I mean, both the Challenger and the Columbia disasters were uh, partially for economic reasons, right? So Challenger uh, needed to launch, there was pressure to launch, the engineers resisted launching, but, but they needed proof of concept, and in Columbia, um, the decision was taken not to uh, abort the scientific payload of the mission by launching a rescue mission either from Earth or, or the astronauts themselves. And so in both of those cases, it was a public initiative, right, but the kind of economic incentives, right, uh, drove the, the decision that led to those disasters. And so I wonder, um, I agree that the future is private, right, that, and, but you're talking about private um, that the private sector is more willing to bear the risk. So is it just that we would accept the loss of life uh, more when it's privately financed? But when I look at what I know of the Columbia and the Challenger disasters, um, it strikes me that the same um, economic incentives, right, to produce your proof of concept or get your scientific payload um, could still be at play for the human risk in the private sector. Mm. Well, um, so there the, the will be risks. I mean, I, I think it is true that... Uh, um, uh, People are more accepting if, if it's some, uh, if one of these adventurers um, uh, comes to a sad end, we, we mourn a brave and resourceful person, but we suspect that's the way they wanted to go. And uh, the big mistake the Americans made was implying that the shuttle was safe and sending up the school teacher and all that, where they should have said, this is dangerous, we're sending these brave astronauts who are like test pilots. So then there would not have been the national trauma. But, uh, but clearly, um, th there'll be misjudgments made, there will be accidents. And I think uh, one has to uh, accept it. And that's why I think this phrase, space tourism, yeah. will uh, uh, bite back at the people who use it. And if I can just add, with, with Apollo 1, for example, so Apollo 1, you lost the three astronauts uh, on the ground back in 1967, but because of the knowledge gained from their deaths, you, you lost no astronaut in space during the Apollo program. So sometimes accidents do happen, but sometimes you can learn from that accident and that risk to make it safer for future explorers. Thank you, and that's really interesting presentations. Um, I just wanted to maybe... Um, touch on the question that was raised about why people might entertain um, settling on Mars, for instance, because I don't think it's that crazy. Um, I actually think it's an extremely interesting proposition because, well, for several reasons. I mean, firstly, life on Earth is not, may not be as robust as we imagine. I mean, an asteroid crash or something could mess up Earth in some ways as well. But on top of that, I think that, you know, as you mentioned, like the, the words that you use, like Mayflower moments, I think there was something extremely captivating of the human imagination about putting humans somewhere else as well that I think can fire up people in a way that's really powerful and that's something that's very exciting. Um, and from what I understand about reading about private companies, Elon Musk's attempts, um, I don't think it's just a matter of that they are willing to accept more risk. The fact is that they are doing things a lot more cheaply than NASA and a lot of the government agencies are doing, which is also really revolutionary in making it feasible um, for something like this to happen in a way that, well, um, you know, it doesn't seem that far off. And I think that this is, this is something that it's really cool that in our future could be something that we can look forward to. So I just wanted to, you know, maybe give another viewpoint that this could be something to also celebrate and look forward to as well instead of, well, yeah. Do you want to pick up on that? <laughs> Why me? I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm not, it's, I'm, be, you know, I'm not dissing human exploration at all. I think it is exciting. It's just I don't want it to be funded from my science budget. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. The gentleman up there in the black jacket. Uh, so many of the technologies we use today, like internet, GPS, many things came from military and space-related R&D. So what are the next ones? What are the technologies that we can perhaps get from 
the R&D currently developed in space-related R&D? Um, well, it's, it's true that uh, uh, many came, came from the military. Um, uh, consumer electronics, of course, is, uh, is fueling the as much as the military these days. But I think of the technologies that's going to be important, I think it is um, robotics and uh, generalized machine learning and better sensors, because, of course, uh, uh, although um, uh, machines can, uh, can play games better than humans, uh, they can't move around the pieces on a real chessboard as adeptly as a child can yet. And so I think the big uh, uh, weakness of robotics now is sensors and actually interacting in a delicate way with the environment. And that's, I think, the technology which is going to be obviously useful in many contexts, but especially in space. And just to add to that, I mean, I agree. There's that there are one or two obvious things that are going to come out, but the most exciting things are the things we can't predict. If you knew what it was, what your spin-off was going to be, space exploration is not the most efficient way of getting there. But it's the, it's the incidentals that come out of, you meet one particular challenge, and then you see how that can develop in other ways when you've met that challenge. So to me, the, the more exciting thing is the things we can't even conceive of that, you know, this is true blue skies things. We, we reap the dividend, you know, decades in the future, and we can't predict what they are now, but we know enough from, well, as Sarah and Martin both said, the history of what's happened of space exploration, what we've learned from it, that we can be confident there will be very valuable spin-offs. Mm, yes. and, and just one thing, GPS, um, which was developed to, uh, to guide American missiles, etc., and the people at that time, they couldn't have conceived there to be literally billions mm -hmm. of GPS receivers for sat nav and in every mobile phone, etc. That's been about the most amazingly cost-effective bit of public investment. Mm -hmm. and, and I think just to add to that, there's, there's a great quote from JBS Holdain, which I think actually uh, applies to space exploration as well. And it's the universe is not only as strange as you can imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. So we can't even begin to imagine what we could potentially see in the next, in terms of technology or what we'll find with space. So next question. Right, thank you. Um, really enjoyed those talks. Um, so, Lord Rees, you had a comment where you said, you know, we're probably not going to find the solutions to human dilemmas by settling other planets. That, you know, the, the most hospitable of these environments um, are like Everest, <coughs> sorry, like the top of Everest or something like that. And yet, in the public imagination, I think, around space travel, there is this idea that whatever, you know, carrying capacity limits we might run into, what problems on climate or scarcity that we might be facing that we can, you know, look to the stars for answers. And so I guess my question to the panel is, how can we simultaneously keep the appropriate focus on the human dilemmas we face on Earth um, whilst not, whilst selling a compelling narrative of looking to the stars, and how do we make sure one doesn't take away from the other, but keep both side by side? I mean, Good question. I, I just don't see that's a problem, because the resources we're devoting to space is sort of... Um, a fraction of 1% of world GNP at most. So I just don't see it's a problem. I think we ought to um, avoid people getting delusions that we can solve our problems by going into space. I just don't think we can. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with that as well. And I think um, mm. you could argue that um, the way technology is progressing, eventually that technology does trickle down so that the poorest, you know, 100 years ago might have... Well, sorry, the richest 100 years ago have what the poorest have now. So it, it takes time, but um, I think it can benefit life back here on Earth as well. And I think one of the reasons we went into space is to look back at our Earth uh, and to be inspired to maybe to look after that planet more. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to life here on Earth as well as just going deeper into the solar system. And I think one of the most important things we learn by exploring the variety of circumstances within the solar system is how unique life is, or you know, how unique the Earth is. And, you know, the... It looks like there may well not be life in any form elsewhere in our solar system. You know, we probably need to look after the Earth that much better. And the more we learn about how different the other planets are, the more I think we realize we need to look after the Earth. OK, question there. We've got time for probably two more questions. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about my research. I have to, I study birds, and I have to have four different permits in the US to study the birds, and when you're talking about commercial enterprises going up into space and um, 
you know, doing kind of whatever. Is there any kind of permit process that, like, can just anyone go into space? Or, like, how, what are the regulations? I think, oh, sorry. But yep. if you, yeah, I think if you're looking at terms of Virgin Galactic and tur tourism, if we want to use that word, um, companies such as that, um, there are regulations. It's regulated by the FAA, but what you're saying is um, it's not as tight. So sometimes when you're developing a new industry, you need to take a step back and allow for progression. So it's the same with if you look at companies such as Planetary Resources, for example, who want to mine asteroids for rocket fuel. It sounds like something out of science fiction, but that's what they're working on. Um, you know, there are laws to do it. It's comparable to maritime law at the moment with, you know, if you go there, you can take it and own it. But it's still a very developing a developing area. But everyone who works in the fields believes that we're all on the same side and we're working towards the right target and people are good and it will work out. So, yes, there are regulations, but it's not as tight at the moment, but that will change as technology develops. And indeed, many of us are worried that the sort of international legal agreements are way behind the actuality in terms of space development. And, you know, think about simple things like the number of nations going to the moon now. If somebody wants to land on the moon and start strip mining it, well, how are you going to stop them? Yeah. You know, it's one thing having legal agreements, but how you also enforce them is the, the other issue. So I think that while there is general, I dread to say it, gentleman's agreement, but about how you go about landing on other planets and what you do, the reality may soon accelerate away, and we need to revisit these legal um, agreements and work out how we make them more binding. Right, time for one more question. Yeah. Oh. Um, so things have been said about uh, space exploration being commercially driven uh, moving forward. And you talked about uh, space tourism uh, to some extent. I've also heard about um, mining as being a possible industry. And I, I just, I'm trying to understand how mining can be. Um, and if you could explain that a bit. Um, it, it seems like regardless of how cheap space um, launching rockets is going to be, you need a lot of fuel, you need a lot of expense to go out somewhere, mine an asteroid and bring that back. Is there anything that's <laughs> so valuable that it actually makes economic sense to do so? Uh, I've heard helium-3, but is there anything, is that real? Well, you could actually say with the, one of the most important things with space mining is actually you've got um, water on asteroids, you've got hydrogen and oxygen, so you've got the key ingredients for rocket fuel, and it's cheaper to, and this does sound like science fiction, but it's cheaper to mine an asteroid for those ingredients to have rocket fuel to then go further into space than to launch with all the things you need. Um, you know, the Tchaikovsky equation tells us um, that. So the idea of space mining, yes, people want to bring minerals back to Earth. Yes, there's, you know, in theory, more um, value in minerals in the asteroid belt to redefine wealth here on Earth. But one of the most exciting possibilities for mining is to actually allow us to collect fuel on the way and, and to explore further into the solar system. And not just collect fuel, mine the materials to make your space rocket, build your space rocket on the asteroid, then use it to explore the other part of the solar system. It's use, it, use the asteroids as a staging post. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for the brilliant talk and presentation. I have an issue in particular with what or something uh, that uh, Professor Reeves said. So I'm not very happy with this idea of a post-human life. Uh, that is a robotic <laughs> life. And I, and I tried to explain why very briefly. Um, if, if, we take, uh, if, if, we, if we think, if we take it, the brain, as a computational machine of a certain kind, then its evolution is a robotic life. Now, isn't it time to change this paradigm? The brain is also a computational machine, but there are other skills. Isn't it time to put an emphasis on these other skill, or these other skills? Or, or otherwise, we're going to have a future that is the one that you describe, where life is a robotic life. But I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think, you know, again, speaking also as a human being, I'm slightly <laughs> worried about this. But, but I think, but my point was that um, I think probably on Earth, um, uh, this is not going to happen uh, because we are adjusted um, to live on the Earth and we may um, impose um, ethical or prudential constraints on these cyborg technologies and on genetic modification. But uh, if we imagine that these people going into space are um, really sort of on, they have the frontier spirit, they've got to adapt to a very different environments, then uh, we would wish them good luck in uh, adapting uh, to this environment. And that adaptation 
may involve them becoming uh, uh, more, more like machines, more electronic. So my scenario is that this will happen. Um, and uh, it, it may leave life like us here on the Earth, but this will happen. And the important point is that the time lying ahead for that evolution is longer than the time it's taken for Darwinian evolution to get from protozoa to us. And moreover, the future evolution will happen not on a slow time scale of Darwinian selection, but on a technological time scale. Mm -hmm. So that's why we should see ourselves as nearer the beginning than the end of this emergent complexity and intelligence. Uh, you may not like it, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's, it, it, it will happen unless, unless uh, life is unique to the Earth and we snuff out life here. Um, but I think it is, it's going to happen, but I think mainly away from the Earth, because um, these creatures may be happier under zero G. Okay, that's it. Um, we're actually out of time now, unfortunately, but I just wanted to ask you both a very, very quick question um, before we conclude this panel. Uh, and it's more of a personal one, and it is, um, what inspired you to pursue space and to sp pursue the exploration of our universe? Both um, of you. Yeah. Uh, with me, it's just the beauty of the night sky. Um, so I started out as a child going out and looking at the night sky. I went with my father who liked to watch the satellites go over. I got bored waiting for the satellites and wanted to watch the stars. But as soon as you start watching, you think, well, what is it? And then you start reading the science behind them. And so I got hooked at a very early age. And so far, nothing I've learned about astronomy has really disappointed me yes. in that original fascination. Yes. And Martin? Yes. Well, mine was the same. And I got into astronomy and, of course, the uh, technology um, for, of astronomy uh, is based on big telescopes on the ground, but increasingly telescopes in space to observe uh, um, infrared, ultraviolet, and X-rays, etc. And astronomy has advanced hugely rapidly in the last decades. Uh, the pace has not slowed down, and that is mainly, of course, due to this technology. Um, armchair theory doesn't get you very far by itself. Uh, we're not as clever as Newton was, uh, and we've advanced because of these new technologies. And uh, I find the technology is very exciting. And of course, what they discover is very exciting. OK, that concludes it. So um, thank you very much to Carolyn and Martin. <laughs>